In this video from Learn Electrics, we will look at the frequently asked question about installations that have no CPC or earth conductors in the lighting circuit wiring. We consider the options available to us and make references to the relevant wiring regulations. We will be using BS 7671 18th edition to amendment number 2, the brown book. There are lots of comments on social media about this and much discussion at training centres and colleges. The electrician tells us that a customer wants a lighting circuit extended but there is no CPC in the existing circuit and they ask what can I do? So in this video we will discuss the requirements and recommendations of the regulations. Many older lighting installations those that were pre-1966 or pre-14th edition were installed without a CPC. Sheathed cables were used that were two live conductors only, line and neutral, or sheathed singles were installed. And the method used was the two-plate lighting method, where we take the live and neutral feed direct from the consumer unit to the light switch. The three-plate method of wiring a lighting circuit takes the live conductor feed to the ceiling rows first and then a switch live to the light switch. You should be familiar with both of these methods. If not, we have several videos on lighting circuit types on the Learn Electrics YouTube channel and on learnelectrics.com website. I've used mostly brown and blue conductor colours in the video as most of us now quickly recognise these as line and neutral colours but red and black were the colours used for the old wiring standard. A lot of lighting circuits without a CPC will in fact be coloured red and black. Also, for better understanding, I have deliberately left the sheathing short on the drawings so that you can count the wires. Some of the regulations are important to the aims of this video and we've listed them here. Of course, many other regulations matter too but these are the ones that we will be looking at. The chart shows the regulation number and the page number along with a very brief note as to what the regulation is about. And page numbers refer to pages in the brown wiring regulations book. We can begin with additions and alterations. Regulation 132.16 talks generally about all additions and all alterations. In this video, we're looking at additions, alterations, extensions to an existing lighting circuit. Regulation 132.16 is found on page 26 of the Brown Book. It tells us that no addition or alteration, temporary or permanent, shall be made to an existing installation unless it has been ascertained that the rating and condition of any existing equipment, including that of the distributor, will be adequate for the altered circumstances. Furthermore, the earthing and bonding arrangements, if necessary, for the protective measure applied for the safety of the addition and alteration, shall be adequate. In other words, we cannot just turn up in the van, install that extra lighting point and then disappear again. There are things for us to consider. Is the existing installation up to the job of being extended? How do we know? Have we checked? Have we looked? Have we tested? Is the bonding and earthing adequate? And so on. What else do we need to do to make the installation not only work as intended, but to also be safe? And it is safety and function that matters. The way that I always look at it is like this. The finished work should be as safe and function as well after the work is completed as it did before the work started. After all, we've gone there to make things better, not worse. Consider exposed conductive parts next and regulation 411.3.1.1. This regulation will be found on page 63. It says that exposed conductive parts shall be connected to a protective conductor under the specific conditions for each type of system earthing as specified in regulations 411.4 to 
0.6. We usually consider exposed conductive parts to be any metallic parts of an accessory or appliance that can be touched and that may become live during a fault. If we can touch it, and if it can become live, we're going to get an electric shock. So we, as people, need protecting from that shock. The regulation specifically says protective earthing, and we should not confuse this with functional earthing. Protective earthing is provided for the protection of people, livestock and property. Functional earthing, on the other hand, enables equipment to function correctly. For example, by establishing zero volt reference points and for electromagnetic screening as we find in data cable installations. Remember that functional earthing does not offer protection to either the person or the equipment. There was a period when not supplying a CPC saved copper. After World War II, there were severe shortages of copper and the country was also going through a massive house building boom. Consequently, not providing a CPC saved tons of copper nationwide every year. Coupled with that was this new wonder material called plastic. Factories could churn out just about everything you needed in the modern plastic. As we all know, plastic is a non-conductive material. Light fittings and switches were non-conductive with no exposed metallic parts. Even if you touch them, you are not going to get an electric shock. So why provide an earth path for the lighting? Let's save copper instead. But then, after a few years, people wanted to modernise their homes, and don't we all? Out went the old plastic switch faces and lamp fittings, and in came polished steel switches and fancy brass chandeliers and other metallic lighting accessories. But now, there's no CPC or earth to make things safe in the event of a fault. And what about the protective conductor itself? What assurances do we have that that little piece of copper wire is going to be there to do its job if needed? Regulation 543.3.1 on page 202 tells us that a protective conductor shall be suitably protected against mechanical and chemical deterioration and electrodynamic effects. Agreed? But how do we determine what makes the conductor suitable for the job. For that, we can look at regulation 543.1.1 on page 199. This regulation is to do with the cross-sectional area of the CPC to the lighting circuit in our case. If the CPC conductor is part of the cable, as in twin and earth cable, or enclosed in the same trunking or containment system as the live conductors, then we can use the adiabatic equation or tables that are provided in the regulations. But here we are assuming that this is not the case. The new CPC conductor is not part of the cable and is not part of the same trunking system. This leaves us with two scenarios. First, the new protective conductor can be given mechanical protection throughout its length by placing it in trunking, sheathing or similar. Or, positioned behind a physical barrier that prevents inadvertent damage to the conductor. In this case, the CPC must not be less than 2.5 square millimetres in CSA or greater if the adiabatic equation or tables suggest a greater size. Second, if there is no mechanical protection provided, if it is just a CPC conductor laid across a loft or other area, then the minimum size should be 4 square millimetres, or even greater, as per the adiabatic equation. The sizes, though, are not indicative of the fault currents expected to flow. Rather, they are to give the conductor greater mechanical strength, so that they will not break easily if tripped over or caught by some object. Basically, we want the CPC to be stronger than your customer's ankle when they trip over it in the loft. And why? Because a broken protective conductor in the loft will not affect the functioning of the lights. The loft will be closed up with every intention of getting someone to look at it next week. But I know, and you know, that that does not happen. It's out of sight, out of mind, 
and is forgotten about. Until the day that there is a fault and the CPC cannot do its job. What about the proximity of conductors to each other? How close should the new CPC be to the existing cables that it is protecting? On page 204, we have regulation 543.6.1. It states quite simply that where the overcurrent protective devices are used for fault protection, the protective conductor shall be incorporated in the same wiring system as the live conductors or in their immediate proximity. If the new CPC is not part of the same cable as the live conductors or not in the same trunking system, then it must be physically next to it, ideally touching the sheathing of the live conductors so that it can offer the best protection in the event of a fault. Think of a twin and earth cable. If the cable is cut through, the chances are that the cutting object, or whatever causes the damage, is also going to make contact with the CPC inside the twin and earth. We want to replicate that as much as possible, so that any object that damages the live conductors also makes contact with the new CPC. And this would never work if the new CPC was allowed to be several centimetres away from the live cables. We have to think what can go wrong, how do we limit the effects. However, if additional protection is provided by a 30 milliamp RCD or RCBO, then the CPC does not need to be in the same containment or as physically close to the live wires as before if this is not achievable. A gap is permitted, but the regulations do not specify any maximum dimensions for the gap, in which case common sense should prevail. And a final solution? There is always a final solution, or two. Has the customer considered a rewire of the whole lighting circuit to incorporate the new lighting extension? If the circuit is more than a certain age, has it started to show signs of degradation? The installation may be the original circuits from 1966, or even earlier, in which case a rewire could be long overdue. Can we rewire and bring the old lighting points and the extended lighting up to the latest regulations? Another alternative is to install a completely separate circuit for the new lighting extensions. In the introduction to BS 7671 on page 4, we find the following information. Existing installations that have been installed in accordance with earlier versions of the regulations, may not comply with this edition in every respect. This does not necessarily mean that they are unsafe for continued use or require upgrading. What this means is that if a pre-existing circuit was installed to a previous edition of the regs and still complies with those same earlier regulations, then it can be left alone. It is doing the job that it was intended to do when it was first installed. That means that there is an option to leave the existing lighting circuit untouched and to install a new circuit just for the new lighting extension. The new lighting circuit would need to comply with the most current wiring regulations in force at the moment. So we leave the old circuit alone and comply to the older regulations and we install a new circuit that complies to the latest regulations. It's another solution to be considered. And there we have it, a brief look at lighting circuits that have no CPC and what we can do about it. We hope that you've enjoyed the video and thank you for watching, it really is appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.